Hey, welcome to Hear God's Word. This is Michael. In this podcast, we study and dissect the Bible to better understand what it means and is trying to say. Whether we cover intense word studies or simple stories, there's so many layers and it's all important. So, if you want to hear what God has to say, then let's dive in. Hey everyone, this is Michael, and I'm glad that you're back listening to the podcast. And this is back to the in-depth study of the actual words of Scripture, and we're starting on Genesis 2-4. So as we read this, you'll begin to notice that it's actually a flashback and rehashing what we've talked about, but then we're also going to talk about how it seems like there's some contradictions in if you compare it to the first iteration of the creation story. So we'll talk about what's going on. Let's read Genesis 2, 4 through 7. So we're going to read from the NLT so that it's a little bit easier to comprehend some of the more complicated language in here. So 2, 4 through 7 says, This is the account of the creation of the heavens and the earth, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth, for the Lord God had not yet sent rain to water the earth, and there was no people to cultivate the soil. Instead, springs came up from the ground and watered all the land. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. So, here we have lots of things going on. We, like we talked about, have, like it starts off saying, a account of the creation of the heavens and the earth, but then it's talking about how there weren't any plants or anything, or there wasn't a human and so then it makes you scratch your head a little bit like didn't we just go through the whole creation like why are we back to square one or two or and i think that we somewhat have an answer based off of what we've talked about before remember how the very first verse of Genesis says God created the heavens and the earth, and then we go back and there's essentially nothing and it's formless. So why would God have created everything? And then it's like, whoops, sorry, actually, yeah, nothing was created. So we have a similar sort of thing in a way here going on. And this gets into a few different approaches, which is number one, there is essentially in this account, as it says, which literally, if you translate it, it means generations or something that is giving birth or bearing or raising up. And so like we can see that there's a story being raised and there is a story that is being given birth to and essentially that's what an account or a record or history or story is is essentially the story of the generations so it's basically now trying to get at like so Now that we went over how the creation happened, let's get into more detail. So let's go over it again in a little bit of a different way. So this is the approach that we'll come at with this. 
And there's also the documentary hypothesis theory, which we've talked about at least once before. And essentially, it's the hypothesis that some people believe there were several different writings of essentially biblical or priestly or scribal texts and the early Hebrews and scribes, they ended up compiling and putting some different sources together. And the theory is that basically that first part had a text that had used the term Elohim being a general term for God because maybe it was around beforehand or earlier on in history. And then at the same time, potentially later, they hypothesized that there was another priestly or other sort of text that came along that used the actual name of God. Because if you notice for the very first time, even though you can't catch it in English translations, if you know what it's trying to say, when you see the capital, the all caps, L-O-R-D for Lord, when it says in verse 4, when the Lord God, essentially the all caps Lord is actually the name of God, which is pronounced several different ways, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but a lot of people use Yahweh, or some people use the Old English, which is Jehovah, and there's lots of different ways that people pronounce it, different variations, but in between the time of the Old Testament and the New Testament, they had either lost the pronunciation or they purposely stopped saying it because the name of God is more special than any other name. And as you keep reading through the book, you can see that, like we've talked about with the term holiness before, like that God is holy and he's set apart from all other humans. So even his name is set apart from all other names. And that's why the Bible uses terms. And you may have heard something like this, but like the name above all names, or we talk about his name being holy and so it's in a totally different category than all other names. So that's why a lot of Jewish people and even some Christians opt to solely use the term Lord. And you may also recognize the Hebrew term, which is Adonai. And in another interesting one, especially in Hebrew, they'll actually call God the name. So we've been talking a lot about God's name, and literally that's a way that some people refer to him, and you may have potentially heard this at some point, but Hebrew people will also call God Hashem, and it's not very common, and I'm not sure if it actually occurs in Scripture, but I know that there's tons of times where it does talk about the name of the Lord, and so what is the name of the Lord? We finally have found out who the creator God who has been making everything is. It actually uses back-to-back -back terms. It's Yahweh Elohim. So basically, Yahweh God is what it says. And so Yahweh is his name and God is actually a title and God is not God's name. And so we'll expand through time and especially 
if and when we get to Exodus, we'll actually finally get a proper explanation for God's name. And even yet then, it's this so hard to grasp mystery on how God's name is what it is. But I'll essentially say that what Yahweh means is he is what he is, or uh, he will be who he will be, or there's so many ways to translate it. I am that I am. You guys may have heard, uh, especially in the Exodus story with Moses later on, actually being face to face with God during seeing him in a fire in a bush. And so I know all of these things are a huge overload at the second, but this is going to be the beauty is like we're finally starting to personally get to know God. He's not just God out there. He is Yahweh, and that is his name. One last thing I wanted to mention, basically God's name essentially is a form of the word is or to be or am and i think that that's one of the most beautiful and amazing it sounds funny but my favorite word in all of language is actually the word is because without something that is or without being itself nothing is and as we've learned about, God is the reason that everything actually came to be. And as we were looking at the days when God was creating things, it says that he said and things were and were or be or be came. All those words come from the same root. And I hope you guys are just as blown away as I am by who God is. So with that, we're going to jump into talking more specifically again about the text. So we just started talking about who is God. His name is Yahweh. And so... This is basically like it goes back and talks about the account or the story or essentially even when it uses the word generations in a lot of translations, it's basically talking about like this is the birth of events that follows or is following the storyline of the creation of the heavens and the earth. And then you can kind of see it gets a little bit poetic again. And it says, this is the account of the heavens and the earth. And then it kind of rehashes it again when they were created by the Lord God who made the earth and the heavens. So it reverses it there. And in the net Bible that we've went over before, it, says in the 13th note, it has a textual note that says basically the order is reversed, but the meaning is the same. So although we don't really do this a lot in our language, something really common we'll see all through the Bible and through Hebrew text is they'll basically get poetic in a way and they'll Especially, you can see in a lot of Hebrew songs, which is the Psalms, or in prophetic writing, or even in stories, or when they're trying to emphasize a point, they'll say something, and then they will restate it in a different way, but essentially meaning the same thing. So, let's get into, now that we've talked about the very beginning and essentially the implications of having this second 
time around talking about the creation. Of course, we could go back even to what we were talking about in the last episode, which was a special one recapping the very first iteration and the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis, talking about the creation story. We talked about how some people believe in the gap theory and that there could have either been a first creation and now this is actually talking about a whole new world and where like this was basically the second time around or God's second rodeo or, you know, something had happened to the world. But honestly, I think that would be disingenuous to what the Bible is trying to get at. And I don't think that it follows the logic of the whole rest of the book because there's no mention of a past world that used to exist. And it just doesn't make sense that they had some other sort of like first failed attempt of creation because, you know, God ends the creation by saying it's very good when he makes the human. And like we've talked about already, there's a similar repetition and going back like we had from Genesis 1-1 to 1-2. And then we even have within the few days of creation, God creating light, but then he's also going back again and creating the moon and the sun to specifically fill in and govern how the days work specifically. So now I think that even if there was some other texts and the scribes, which essentially are the people who wrote down the text, maybe Moses himself actually was a scribe, just like he was also technically, you can say a priest, and you could technically even say he was a prophet. But that aside, even if they did compile two different sources, being the version or writings that talked about the creation from the viewpoint of the past with the Elohim, and then having the text later on and combining the ones that had the name of Yahweh, the God of the world, it seems fair that even if this was the case, it still doesn't even cause problems because the Bible is what it is, and the people of God and God himself has always been okay with the text that he did inspire, and of course, we can look at and try to understand and be critical of the Bible, and we can throw out our theories. And of course, it's good to also even know some of the facts, and it would be great to know every single fact on the Bible. But at the end of the day, there has to either be a trust or distrust in what it has to say, even a little bit of distrust in this being something that was inspired by God and him leading the people that he chose to accurately depict the creation and all of the other stories that are going to follow. Like, that's pretty important. And so that's a lot of what this podcast is about, like, besides actually talking about, like, the words and meanings 
that the Bible has to say. This is essentially the foundation of Bible study is like f- the first thing that any of us need if we're going to actually get something from something is like we actually have to trust that it's trustworthy and that the message is actually reliable. Otherwise, we're just going to tune out. And I think that there's way too many people who we've already tuned out and decided that like these things that we haven't heard before are like we've talked about you know when i was starting the episode like oh man there's a contradiction one story which we're about to get to in a second but you know the first part of the creation story it says that you know god created all these things in six days but then you know we go back and it says that there weren't any people or there weren't any plants by the time that people were created so like what exactly is going on here and like even it it seems like it gets confusing like it almost is even trying in verse 5 and 6, 7, you know, almost making it seem like plants weren't even around at the time of humans already. And I thought that that happened way before on day four, but now, you know, we're talking about like, man, you know, the Bible doesn't even logically make sense. Like even if it was inspired by God, like, you know, it, it doesn't line up with itself and it doesn't even logically make sense. And like, it's easy to throw these criticisms by just taking a first and shallow glance at the text. And I know that there's even scholars who dive in and do a lot of studying and come away with conclusions that are against the Bible. But if you keep hanging on, and I will give my personal testimony about reading the Bible, and one thing that I will say before we just straight up get into studying the Bible, but I wanted to share myself, like, why do I even do all of this in the first place? It's because, honestly, when I first was challenged to start reading the Bible, I actually didn't want to do it. Like, I've never been a good reader in my life, and I've never been quick. I've never comprehended well on my first time around, and it takes me a lot of sitting and thinking about what something is trying to say to take away the meaning. But this has been the first book that's been different. Like, when I started reading the Bible. I got to the book of Leviticus. And when I was sitting on some steps one day, just minding my own business and trying to understand and learn more about the Bible and giving it a shot, that was the first time that God ever spoke to me. And he told me, Michael, it's not about you, but it's all about me. And that's the day when I actually gave my life to God and committed to him and was saved and started to follow him. Because when I was listening what the Bible had to say, even though I was reading about sacrifices, at the same time, it allowed me to start understanding and hearing God's actual voice. And From that moment on, my life has changed and been very different than the shy and scared and mean and messed up person that I've been in the past. And of course, obviously, I still have problems that I'm working out. And 
everyone always has a temptation and pull and body and flesh and mind that wants to do evil things, even if it's low key bad things. But at the same time, when I started reading the Bible and started finally being able to hear what God had to say, reading through the Bible that first time and ever since then has changed my life. And I actually have become a lot better of a reader and am a hundred times better at comprehending, obviously exaggerated, but much better at comprehending things and there's a passage in the Bible that talks about how God's word is alive and living and it's sharper than a two-edged sword. And so I've definitely seen how this book is in a totally different category. It's actually not just a book literally the word bible means book it's not just the book it's not just the bible it's the holy bible it's the set apart book from every other book because it is not just the words of humans but it is the story like it's the generations it's the account of the actual creation of our world like what could possibly give us more security about our origins what could teach us more about god and the things that he made than an actual trustworthy account of it and so that's why i first off named the podcast hear god's word because i don't believe that it's just listen to me talking about and giving my opinions and explanations and theories on just a book. It's something in a completely different category. And so that's my hopes. And of course, you know, I'm still going to keep it real. I'm still going to cover different and all the different perspectives that I can. But at the same time, I can't stay quiet on this topic because reading God's word allowed me to be able to start understanding and hearing what his voice sounds like. And it gave me the tool to be able to hear and understand God and what his message is to us. So keep that in mind and Going back to what we were talking about, you know, if we have something that seems like a contradiction, I was going to state that anytime I've actually put more time and research into it, I've found out that, oh, this thing that seems so scary, like it could rip my faith to shreds and there's no explanation for, there's actually a perfectly logical explanation and a lot of times like there's multiple reasons why something that originally seemed contradictory and scary to face or answer like those things the more that I've spent time learning I've realized you know any issue that's ever come up and throughout all history ends up being able to be resolved because this book is not in the same category. People have tried to shoot it down all of Israel's history ever since they were a very early on like formed people back at the time of Moses, back in the 2nd, 3rd century BC. We've had people through history from then all the way till now trying to tear apart people who believe in this book. But the truth is, it's not ever going anywhere because 
of the fact of what it is. And so, like I said, I won't continue on that anymore, but I wanted to make a bold claim and I wanted to, like, after we've went through the whole story so far of the creation, now we're going to get into more detail and we're going to basically look at it from a different angle now. So essentially we have in verse five, it says, now no shrub of the field had yet grown on the earth and no plant of the field had yet sprouted for the Lord God had not yet caused it to rain on the earth and there was no man to cultivate the ground. So this is obviously saying a few things. It's saying, you know, there were no plants on the earth at the time that it's referring to. And so obviously when God made the heavens and the earth, just like it backtracks in Genesis 1 and we have him creating the heavens and the earth and there was no form to anything. At the same time, we have the same exact thing. We have God creating and like making the form of everything. But now it's kind of like we talked about, you know, even though in the first three days, God basically forms the earth and then the last three days he fills it. This is kind of going into like God's already formed the earth, you know, he's created the heavens and the earth, but now it's going into a more specific view of like what happened in more detail, you know, on those times when he was in between creating the plants and the people. So if we look back on this, you know, we could ask, so is this creation story starting out on day four or day six? Because like we have the plants, but at the same time, they haven't actually, there's two words it uses, like they hadn't sprouted. So did like no plant sprout or just specifically the ones that are talked about starting in the next passage, which we'll be talking about, which is basically God planning the garden or the net Bible says the orchard because specifically of it referring to the trees, which trees in all of the things that I talked about before essentially are fruit trees and all fruit trees are considered orchards. So that's why we can have like all these different various translations because there's so many ways to think about the same exact thing. And that's kind of the point that I'm trying to help get at is like we have just so much data and input in this creation story and there's so many things that we can see and so many things that we can theorize and derive from it but in the end you know if we were to even pull back out and say like okay so if we don't get lost in the weeds like what exactly is this passage trying to talk about like why are we going over this again and like what is it actually trying to say basically it's saying like all right here's the story of the creation of the world you know god hadn't made people but then you know as you keep reading in chapter 2 it's like god made man and he like we talked about he made him in his image and it says that god formed him from the ground so like basically god created a person but then he put his own personal breath into the person so you know linking back to chapter one god made man in his image and if you remember 
from chapter 1, verse 2. It talked about God's spirit hovering, and we talked about how spirit means breath. And what does God put in the human? He puts his breath into the human. And so what's another way of saying that same thing? God put his spirit into the people. Like, isn't that so profound? Like, I've never really realized that before. And this is why I wanted to specifically do this podcast, because there's so many things that I've learned that are, in one sense, you know, complicated or over our head because we don't know Hebrew. But at the same time, it's still accessible to us and people have passed down and like we haven't lost God's word and we haven't lost the message that it's trying to share. And obviously we could get into the weeds and be like, well, did you know that there actually have been lots of changes in the manuscripts and like we don't have the original copies but the fact that we do have so many copies and the story is consistent and there are 66 books and they are all working together on the same story and working towards a goal or god was inspiring and helping protect and preserve the texts that led up to Jesus. And then at that point, there was a consensus of what actually was inspired writings by God. And then, like, even after that, the fact that even more texts about God become flesh actually got preserved. And then the story of the people in the early church who were following Jesus, they got preserved. And all of the prophets' writings and revelation and all of these things, like for all this to happen and through all of the crazy history that has gone on, like there are more texts of the Bible and different versions that like all line up and say essentially the same thing far beyond any other document that has ever existed there is so much validity and backing behind the bible that honestly it's the least worrying of all ancient texts and so we could obviously talk all day, but that's why I want to specifically study like what it has to say as opposed to just having a historical podcast on talking about, you know, all the minute details, kind of like we're talking about. And I told you guys uh, we won't be getting into a lot of this, but at the same time, we'd be fair and look at some of the important aspects and questions behind like the actual history of the Bible. So we've gone into a little bit of it and I've done my best to in a general way and like not going into like hours of research, talk about why the Bible is reliable. So we're going to go back into the fifth verse again, and it talks about how stuff had not sprouted up yet. And we were talking about, is this the fourth or the sixth day that's being talked about? And the answer is not 100% sure. So, when the Bible doesn't say something, obviously, I don't tell you guys exactly 
what you need to believe on it, especially if it's not trying to make a point about the information. And so, you know, like whether it's starting out with the fourth day or even going from the first day straight to the fourth day to the sixth day or even you know talking about the creation in general and then straight to the sixth day so i'm actually going to leave a few links in the show notes and i also did in the last episode but it talks about specifically the seeming conflict of what we're talking about right now and one of the videos in gotquestions.org, and you can also read it on their blog. So in there it says that it doesn't say how long before there was no plant life, which makes sense because the first and the second day of creation are mentioned, and yet there wouldn't have been any plant life then. So... Just as it talks about at the beginning of verse 4, how God created things, and then it talks about there's no plant life. Uh, we don't know how long in between the not sprouting and there being no people actually occurred. So what is the next thing it mentions it says actually that there was no rain that was on the earth and there were no people to cultivate the ground so springs would well up from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground so this kind of brings back the point we've been talking about how God had basically been working on forming things, and now we're getting into the part where God's filling and giving animated things, like such as even the plants. And obviously, it begins to talk about the humans, and even later on, it does also refer to the animals as well. But Basically, the story from here on is going to be mainly zooming into the plants, the people, and a little bit on the animals, but that's more so something related to how God wanted the people to manage all of these things. Like He put them in the garden or on earth like we're going to read about and like in day one it says he blessed them and wanted them to manage or rule the things on earth and so this is basically the point that it's going to come to again so obviously it's not talking about a different story this is all the same cohesive story but it's kind of like when you look at an object from one side of that object and then you pivot around a certain amount of degrees and then you see something different on that object or you know you're looking at the front of a person and you're like oh man face nose uh, eyebrows and then you go to the back and you see mainly just their hair and you're like, huh, this this isn't the same object I was looking at earlier, but it's like, obviously, you're looking at the same thing. Like, we're looking at the same thing. We're looking at the same creation story. It's just from a totally different perspective. It's from a different side. And so whether that was two different accounts that were merged together or whether it's all one writing that originally was produced at the same time but it's like okay we looked at it from one side so let's take a look at what it's trying to talk about now with there not being rain and there being springs so 
Some different translations say mist or fog, others say springs, and if there was no rain, then, you know, how do we have gardens or plants? And maybe this is part of what it's talking about. Uh, we can also highly speculate that the conditions at the beginning of the world, and even doing science, we can tell that the atmosphere back in history had some different qualities to it. And because of that, we also were talking about how the whole paradigm of the world as they either saw it or it actually was back in history was there were waters in the heavens and then there were also waters underneath and we even know that there are springs underground because that's where we got a lot of our drinkable water from there's so many networks even on the land underground of water running through and so it's possible that maybe there were more geysers back then. Maybe there were more just channels of water and spring networks that were going around back in those days. And it's possible that if there was no rain and there really wasn't, maybe the atmosphere was just different during those times and the precipitation cycle didn't work the same exact way that it does now because everything was stored differently, uh, both underground and even in the sky. So we have not unlocked all of the secrets of the past when it comes to science and history. The last thing I'll say on the topic, though, of the springs or the mist or vapor, you know, if there actually was mist and vapor in the air and it was more like a dew that settled as opposed to like actual rain, like it makes sense that still things would be water because there's still obviously moisture in the air regardless and if there is a lot of moisture because of there being plants and it talks about later in the chapter there being rivers and obviously there's also the sea and so like with all of these things we have plenty of water circulating even if the precipitation cycle didn't function in the same way because maybe some of the factors that we have caused the rain to not ever come down the same way until a certain breaking point, which we'll see actually later on. So I think that there's things that are valuable that we could actually learn about our past and most of you guys have probably heard of the story of the great flood with Noah. And so obviously there's a lot of rain. There's 40 days worth of rain that happen. And essentially there's a global worldwide flood. And some people believe that it was regional, but we'll get to that when we get there. Also mention specifically when it says that the springs watered the ground, specifically it means to give drink to. So when you think about a tree and it soaking up the water from underground, you could maybe even think of it this way, that the water is coming up into the ground and the plants. And then it talks about then going on into verse 6, how basically the springs would well up from the earth, which when we talk about this, basically 
Uh, it could mean a few things, like basically the springs came from underground and they actually sprouted into rivers or like they were above the land as well in a visible sort of way, like where maybe there were even caves or um, possibly, like I said, geysers or whatever else. There was some sort of way that water was getting to the ground, which it talks about then in the next verse. It sets up the creation of people. And so, you know, the question is, like it says, there wasn't plants, but now we have all of the infrastructure for there to be. But then it jumps to humans. We're not going to get to it till next week. But do the plants basically come in between basically this time and the people and then it goes into after it talks about the humans in verse 7 then just back into okay now flashback again you know like we have no plants but then we have God making everything for the plants and then we have them, even though we're not going to state it now. And then we have the people. And then now let's go back and talk about the garden again. It's just like, obviously, we don't tell stories usually in this sort of way in English. And in modern thought, we usually try to tell things in a straight line, whereas that's not how Hebrew storytellers told things back then. So we're just going to have to get over our specific way of enjoying and understanding stories. And we can still enjoy, understand, and get out what we need to from this story in Scripture about the creation. and. So, no matter what, basically, we know that God obviously made plants. We know that God made people. Like We see them all around us. These are realities we know that are true. Does it technically even matter, since these things are here and created, which order stuff came in? Obviously, no. You know, in, in one sense... It does, and it's good to have the information. And I think it's clear also that by the first chapter of Genesis, even though it's sporadic in its telling in this second chapter, we can still go back to the first chapter and use it as a guide to follow in this second chapter. We culminate what is obviously day six, God creating the human. And let's get into the specifics because who does it say specifically made the man? And this is actually where we're going to get into more detail, but it says Yahweh God. So any sort of curiosity of like, God or the Elohim making the humans, we now have a even more specific look at, you know, who is the Elohim? It's not a bunch of gods or we don't have, you know, other gods or angels or whatever making the people. Who is Elohim? It's Yahweh. And he is forming or making the man, as it says. And if you look at the word, it's actually, we already hinted at this, but it's the word Adam. And in Hebrew, it's Adam or the man or the human is 
ha adam which the ha means the and adam meaning human or man and we have the same sort of thing in english where if you say mankind or humankind it means literally the same exact thing so a cool and ironic thing and actually it's basically you could say uh, Hebrew rhyming and poetry and puns in one sense. Basically, the word for ground or land is Adama. And you can kind of hear that word Adam and then the A ah at the end, whereas the human is Ha Adam. So it's really amazing because basically God use the Adama to make the Adam. So God used the ground or basically the earth or the soil to make the people. And try this experiment with next time you get wet, either taking a shower or when you're out swimming or out in the rain next time your skin gets wet try and rub off the outer layer of your skin and then take a look at it on your fingers you see this kind of like clay gray sort of substance that comes off which is essentially your dry skin but it really struck me as a parallel you know here it's talking about god used the earth or the ground or like what is the ground made of it's essentially clay and rock and like all of these things minerals and like what are we made of it's actually a lot of the same elements as the actual ground and earth itself and it's no surprise like is it a metaphor you know like did god actually make us from the actual ground itself when it says god formed essentially it's using the same term that's used for a potter forming something so in a way like what does a potter work with he uses clay and what are we made of basically the clay in the soil of the ground and like i think it's such a beautiful way of showing how whether we literally or metaphorically came from the ground it still goes to show that god made us out of material of this earth and it's a really humbling thought as well to think of basically the fact that we are made of and come from dirt and so like in one sense we're just a piece of dirt but at the same time then the beautiful part comes so you know just like god probably created all of the other animals and souls out of the earth it doesn't specifically mention this next part about any other living thing, but it says that God breathed into the nostrils of the person the breath of life, and the man became a living being or soul, basically. And so, like, we know that, obviously, animals have a lot of those same qualities. They still have the breath of life, and they still have breath. Like, however, like I was talking about earlier, the linking between the breath that goes into their nostrils is the thing that comes from God. It makes people special and unique 
And this is that reference back to chapter one, where it's talking about how God made people in his image. He put his stamp, his spirit into people. And when we're living, we always have the availability of God's spirit keeping us alive, keeping everything that's living, moving, like like it talks about, you know, how God's spirit was moving over the waters, basically over everything, even over stuff when even there was nothing, even when there was chaos, God still was moving. And now we have God's breath and like motion coming into us and like honestly what could be more beautiful than like the maker putting his own personal stamp on and into us so you know in physical form we're simply just a bunch of dirt we're a bunch of the materials of this world were physical bodies, but at the same time, we have a spiritual quality to us. And so it's this thing that makes people special and that God specifically wants to connect and build a story around those people that he made like him yet still having the grounding of material reality that we have. Like God wanted to put those spiritual things and in life into motion in a real physical world that can actually be experienced. And that's what we're living in, and this is what we call reality and what we get to experience and see. So there's a few last things I wanted to say before we finish. One of them is we have the man being created here, but wait, another contradiction, man. Like it talked about God creating males and females. Now we just have a man first, like how sexist. But as I talked about before, Technically, the word man is translated human. So is it possible that God made a pair of humans, but technically it doesn't use the plural? So most likely, especially because the story we'll see plays out, like it is talking about an actual male or man because he creates another person that is a female or a woman from the man. So it can be a dual thing. So basically you have the man and the woman. And in one sense, you know, if God in general creates males and females on the sixth day, technically if we're experienced the sixth day, and the sixth day isn't over because it's still talking about the creation of them. There's no contradiction. If anything, there's a strange way of reiterating it. And, you know, again, like we'll talk about when we get to later on in chapter two, when we talk about the woman being created, you know, did God make the man and the woman like right next to each other? Like, is this actually literally and physically how God actually did it? Did he actually take, like we're going to read about later, an actual rib from the man and use it to make the woman? Or is it kind of like metaphorical for talking about how God made the woman like and from the same stuff as the man, but he just wanted her to be beside him, just like obviously our ribs are from our side. 
And so, you know, there's lots of things that people speculate, but at the end of the day, kind of like we have plants and we have animals and we have humans. And at the end of the day, like that's all that really matters is the fact that we are here and we know that God is the one who made us all. The fact is that, you know, there are elements that we'll be able to take away from the story. But as of for right now, we can take away the fact that God made people specifically and put his spirit in us. And so he did make human and he did make us in his image and he put his personal touch into us. And so... I also wanted to talk about two last things, which is tied together. One is that actually, like we were talking about with the section markers, like where do the Hebrews mark their chapters? Basically, we had day one was like a Hebrew kind of chapter or section. Then we had day two, then day three, then then day four, then day five, then day six, then day seven, which was the beginning of chapter two. And now, starting from where we are, literally, there is absolutely no section markers whatsoever until there are a few pauses which we'll talk about later, not until chapter 3. So there's not even any sort of indication that the story is transitioning, even when we get to chapter 3, which is the very famous garden story where the man and the woman eat from the tree in the garden and sin and fall. And so I think it's important, like, how did the beginning of this section start, like we talked about, you know, it's the account or the record or like the generation of what's about to happen. So basically, it's the story of the humans and what happens when they were created. So like towards the very beginning, when they were made, it's going from that and straight into their very early on history. And that's how I want you guys to like realize the story is trying to be portrayed and viewed is there's essentially no stopping the story in between God making the people and the people in the garden. So like as we're gonna learn about the garden more specifically next week we should like keep in mind that this is all one fluid story just even like even though we stop and have reflections on there being distinctions between the first account of the creation story and now this like second version of it basically keep in mind that in one sense this is all one flowing story and if we were to actually read this in the best possible way basically reading straight from the second chapter all the way through the third chapter with a few pauses would be the best way for us to read it. So this is the beginning of the record of history of the world and everything that's going to happen from here on. So let's adventure into it. Hey, I'm so glad you guys could join for today's podcast. I hope things click for you and that you're better able to understand God's word. Jesus said, whoever has ears, let them hear. So keep listening to what God has to say, and I'll see you guys next time. God bless.